Hey, welcome back. Hope you guys had a great week. Today I'm gonna present to you guys, for scary stories from Reddit. If you are new to the channel and don't want to miss any crazy creepypasta stories, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notifications. Now with that out of the way, let's start with the stories. What I saw in the Flamingo Park ghost train will haunt me forever. By Diamond Cube Have you ever been on a ghost train? I don't mean those industrial movie themed rides. I mean those traditional fairground rides that are usually built into black boat houses. If your answer is yes, then you will know just how cheap and nasty some of those things can be. For me, I always felt a wave of nostalgia wash over me whenever I rode one. A little backstory. My name is Edward, I am 22, and I have been going all over the UK searching for small nostalgic thrills, and yes, said thrills are in the form of childish rides, fairground arcades, and wacky fun houses. All of this changed however when I rode the ghost train at Flamingo Park, Hastings, England. When I arrived, I had a route set in my mind. First, I was going to ride the Dodgems, then explore the green jungle maze, and finally finish off with the ghost train. After I ticked off all of the activities on my imaginary bucket list, I approached the old, decrepit jet black building that housed the ghost train. The place felt even more daunting up close, the smell of old wood and the chipped paintwork on the exterior set off a wave of nostalgia. I deposited three ride tokens, three per person, to the man operating the ride. The first thing I was greeted with were the two uneven wooden doors in front of the cart. Painted on the doors was a face split in two. On one of the doors, the face was all skull and bone. On the other, it was covered in skin and muscle, and hanging down was a blood-soaked sheet reading. Help us. I had to admit, it looked pretty graphic, especially for a ride aimed at children. Next, I was greeted by the mail worker who gave me a cliché safety briefing. Stay in the cart, keeping your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside at all times. After that, I was pushed into the pitch-black darkness beyond the two wooden doors. When I say the cart moved slowly, I mean slowly. Slower than any other ghost train I had ever been on. The first thing that caught my attention was how child-friendly the first room was. The whole room was covered in green, red, and yellow UV paint with a buzzing UV light beaming from the ceiling overhead. I could see a creepy-looking skeleton and a few ghosts painted on the far wall. After a short while, my cart made its way into the second room. This room was slightly more graphic. Directly in front of my cart was a realistic-looking prisoner in an electric chair. He convulsed and threw himself back and forth whilst making muffled pleading noises. This was unsettling, but still a good effort for a small, low-budget ghost train. The third room is where things started to get weird. In this room, a clown pressed itself up against a metal gate whilst an animatronic lifted its head out of the socket. What was weird, were the random dolls scattered all over the floor. The fourth room was the one I will never forget, purely because it was the room I got stuck in. The ride itself was pretty dark, so I was tempted to pull out my phone for some light, but that's when I heard it. I don't know if it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but I could hear a faint whimpering sound. It sounded like crying, and I assumed it was a passenger in another cart either in front or behind me. Apart from the distant whimpering, the room was deathly quiet. Suddenly, the crying changed and turned into a deep, raspy laugh. The laughing was low, too low to be a person. I thought that it must have been a hi-fi speaker system, and deep down I was praying to myself that it was. The laughing then ceased and my cart slowly started to move again. The only odd thing about this room was that it seemed to go on interminably. 
No props, no lights, nothing. The only audible sound at this point were the cart's wheels rumbling across the floor. It took me a little while to notice, but I realized that something else was wrong. My car wasn't moving by itself. It was being pushed. I only realized when I heard heavy breathing other than my own directly behind me. What followed next was something I will never forget. The cart suddenly stopped, as did the breathing behind me. Taking its place, were the sounds of light footsteps circling around the cart. I wanted to pull out my phone there and then for some light, but I was paralyzed with fear. I suddenly felt someone get into the cart with me, and their face felt like it was merely inches away from my own, not only that, but I could distinctly feel a warm breath on my neck. I don't know what it was, but something caused me to regain conscious movement. I shoved my hand into my left trouser pocket, fumbled around for my phone, and pulled it out without any hesitation. I turned on the phone's torch and shined it in front of me. There was nothing. Just a track that seemed to go into an endless void. I shined the phone to where the breathing was coming from, and I froze. The face that was merely inches away from my own was absolutely terrifying. It was a woman of average height. Her body was deathly thin with a dirty peach-colored gown over it. Her wavy brown hair hung in clumps down either side, but her face is what still haunts me to this day. It was hollow. Her whole face was like one big mouth. No eyes, no nose, and no ears. I practically dropped my phone when I saw a dark red liquid begin to pool on the inside of her face. The thick liquid oozed down either side, and I could feel myself on the verge of vomiting. Still holding my phone, I looked down with the beaming light and saw that her hand was delicately placed on my right leg. Her fingers were all wrong. Where her thumb should have been was as an index finger, and where her middle finger should have been was a thumb. None of her fingers appeared to be in the right place. I looked back up and gasped as her face was now a mere inch away from my own. I thrashed around violently, screaming until eventually, I passed out. The next thing I knew, I was outside with paramedics above me. Ride workers, parents, and children all stood around me passing strange looks at each other. I felt slightly embarrassed, but after what I had just seen, I couldn't do anything. Apparently, the car I was in had derailed, and the man operating the ride heard me shouting. He came in to find me curled up on the floor next to my cart. I was rushed to a hospital later on that day. After a few hours, they didn't find any issues regarding my physical health, so needless to say, I was sent home. It has been years since this happened. I was always scared to tell people, fearing they might call me crazy. I would have agreed with the notion that I was crazy, had it not been for the fact that I found dark red stains on my clothes the following day. The Beast in the Woods by Kim Young underscore Poon 32 Hey all! Before I post this I'd just like to say this is the first scary story I've ever written. Feedback is more than welcome. My name is Jason and I work a pretty typical ranch job in southern Montana that borders the Crow Reservation. Wake up every day, saddle a horse, and make sure you have everything you need for the job you need that day. Whether it is fencing, sorting, collecting, or whatever the foreman tells you to do honestly. I arrived in Montana in late May and have fallen in love. I came from eastern Missouri and never really knew what the mountains had to offer. Both good and ungodly. I never really bought into anything supernatural. I just thought that the stories the wrangler named Willie who hailed from the Crow tribe were a complete fallacy. Made to cover years and years of mistreatment, discrimination, and murder by the early European settlers. On this faithful day, we were riding out to find a bear who had been terrorizing our cattle. 
So naturally what I brought that day was my .45 long Colt single action revolver and my Henry 45 to 75 and of course camping supplies since it may take us a few days. For those who don't know a 45 to 70 is considered to be a small elephant gun, and while we weren't hunting elephants I figured it'd be big enough for a grizzly. As far as the .45 long Colt single action revolver, well two guns is better than one and the .45 long Colt is very large for a pistol so it has a chance against any animal. Willie and I rode out around 10 a.m. since it was about a four-hour ride to the northeastern part of the ranch where we thought this bear was. Along the way, while Willie and I are talking he starts telling me stories of things he'd seen in the mountains since he grew up not far away. These mountains man, they make my skin crawl Willie. Bullshit man all those stories are fake, fallacies. I mean creatures that can mimic any sound they hear to lure you in and kill you? Come on, stop trying to scare me. I wouldn't talk like that if I were you, they'll hear you. Yeah man whatever, let's just get this done. I will admit. These stories he told me did make my stomach drop with the amount of detail he had in them. It was rather impressive. He could make a killing as a scary story writer. Three and a half hours into our ride I had to stop to, well let's just say the Browns were running down the tunnel. Willie kept writing. Something in cowboy culture that is considered insanely rude but I understood. He wanted to get there and get this done. No one liked killing a bear but it was messing with our livelihood and we were responsible for these cows lives. When I was finishing up I hear Willie further up the trail scream what the fuck is that. I quickly untie my horse and draw my .45 LC and ride like hell to go save my friend. When I came upon him it was like he'd seen a ghost. I asked him Willie what is going on. Are you okay? But Willie didn't answer. He had a thousand yard stare about him and was mumbling something to himself in his native language I obviously didn't understand. Before I could ask him what he was saying I looked down about 20 feet in front of him and my breakfast almost came up from what I saw. Laying there was what looked like one of our most prized heifers completely, well just completely decimated. Strangely though, there was not a single drop of blood anywhere around her. I holster my pistol and pull out my rifle. At that moment I look at Willie and say dude what the fuck pull your gun the bear is about in the coldest and emotionless voice I have ever heard he says, all while still staring nowhere in particular, that wasn't a bear, we shouldn't be here I respond with man this bear is about. Let's set up camp here and get searching or the boss will kill us you don't understand Jason. This isn't the work of a bear this is a work of eight swayoy willy, English please. He then coldly turns to me and says skinwalker. Willie they aren't real. Cowboy the fuck up and let's kill a bear that line lit a fire under Willie who was desperate to prove he could out cowboy anybody and everybody. I used this to my advantage several times in the short amount of time we'd lived together. We set up camp quickly and made out around the surrounding woods to track this bear. That is when it all started. When we were pretty far from Camp Willie went east a bit to hang a piss. Before he left he said, hey Jason, don't go too far. I responded, yeah yeah man, just hurry up. While I'm sitting there on a stump checking my rifle I hear Willie off to the west say Jason. I was confused because I swear Willie had gone off to the east but I figured maybe he went around to mess with me. I said back hurry the fuck up man we got shit we need to do as I said this Willie comes walking back from the east and looked at me puzzled Jason who are you talking to? What do you mean? I am talking to, never mind, figuring my mind was playing tricks on me since we were alone in the mountains and stuff like that isn't out of the ordinary. We continue on with our hunt as dusk begins to set in and for the last 30 minutes I couldn't help but think we were being watched I looked at Willie once with a concerned look and he says I feel it too as dusk starts turning into night we decided to head back to camp but neither of us could shake the feeling. Something was out there, stalking us. 
I assumed it was just the cougar or even the bear we were after since cougars especially stalk potential prey before they strike. As we get back to camp we start a fire and start roasting a rabbit I had shot earlier in the day for supper along with some beans. A cowboy staple, Willie, and I are just sitting around the fire talking about life and all manner of things until I feel a churning in my gut. Knowing what this means I take some of the dude wipes I brought along and a trash bag to throw them in when I was done as well as my .45 LC just in case something wanted to fuck around and find out. I waddle off to the south down a slight hill so Willie wouldn't be able to see me or even mess with me because that is one thing that he loved to do. It was pitch black at this point so I can't see anything other than the stars and what was lit dimly by the moonlight. I am trying to make it quick because ever since earlier I still hadn't shaken the feeling that we were being followed and watched, even now hence the 45. I am staring up at the stars when all of a sudden I hear something about 30 feet in front of me rustling in the trees it sounded, big. As I look in the direction trying to make out what was over there but it was just a damn dark. However, I could tell whatever it was watching me. A few seconds pass by when I realize something. All the sound in the forest had stopped. As any experienced outdoorsman knows. When this happens there is a predator around. So I draw my pistol and pull the hammer back. I am figuratively and literally shitting myself when I hear it. Jason. Hurry up I found it coming from in front of me. I fire a shot into the ground because I now knew it was just Willie messing with me so I figured I would give him a better scare. I don't get even. I get ahead. I heard Willie running off into the woods so I start to get up to chase after him when all of a sudden I hear running coming up from behind me right as I get my pants up. I cock my pistol back again ready for whatever is coming. I move up the hill to confront whatever it was and as I start to crest the hill I hear Willie screaming and running towards me rifle in hand Jason Jason dude Jason are you okay? At the sight of this I completely lose it breaking into a ball on the ground pistol in hand. Willie, I say voice quivering it was you. I heard you in the woods earlier in the east and I heard you in the woods just then in front of me. What is going on he looks at me puzzled. Jason I did go off to the east earlier. And I was sitting by the fire when I heard the shot so I figured, at that moment we both heard it. Coming from the bottom of the hill and my voice Willie I got it. I looked to see what the fuck it was I just heard that could mimic me so well when Willie pulls me to the ground in a crouching position. Now a look of pure fear and seriousness plastered on his face. He looked at me and said one phrase, Zate Swayoi. I didn't need to be a native to remember or know what that meant so I said in a hushed voice no that's impossible they aren't real. Logic still trying to take control of my brain. Willie looks at me and in a whisper responds you need to forget everything you think you know about these mountains, right now, a grizzly is the least of our fucking worries, as he said this he motioned for us to move back to camp. We made it back to camp shortly after. Willie was pacing around and praying in his native tongue. I have never felt so helpless in my life. So, little. As I stare at the fire and contemplate what it all meant, I have one question burning in my mind. Can we kill it? Willie looks at me and says not even a howitzer could take this thing down, Jason. These creatures are witches. Beings of power your European blood could never grasp. I told you we shouldn't be here and now the odds that we die tonight are not exactly in our favor. Why don't we just leave? I mean we pack light. The trail is clear cut and mostly pasture. That is the worst thing we can do. The only thing protecting us right now is the fire. They don't like light. If we were to pack up and leave. Us and our nags would be dead before we even were in the saddle. We have to survive till morning. Only then do we stand half a chance. What are our odds man? 2080. Not in our favor. I shivered at this. 
thinking about all the things I'd never gotten to do. When all of a sudden I looked up at Willie who was staring into the woods. I tracked his gaze and immediately saw what he was looking at. There at the edge of the clearing where we'd made camp were two glowing eyes. Except they were on the ground. They were at least halfway up the aspen tree it was standing by. I couldn't believe it. The thing in the woods had to have been at least 10 feet tall. I screamed and Willie shot a terrified look my way. We locked eyes. Looked back and the thing was standing 15 feet from the campsite. I didn't think and pulled my rifle loaded around and fired. The thing stumbled backward and then just stood up and smiled. It was then that I took a second to really look at the creature. 10 feet tall with long arms that went down to its knees that ended in razor sharp talons. Willie looks at me and screams what have you done? You've killed us. In the blink of an eye I see the thing's talons rip through the center of his chest and hoist him up. Blood is everywhere. More blood than I'd ever seen in my life. A smile was still painted across the thing's face. I could tell it wasn't doing this for the hunt. It was doing this because he liked it. The thing dropped Willie to the ground and disappeared into the night. I run over to Willie who was still breathing but just barely. He looked at me and said you won't survive the night. Run. With those words, he coughed up a mouthful of blood and took his last breath. I grabbed my guns and a lantern and hightailed it back southwest towards the bunkhouse. I was about a mile away from the camp when behind me, I heard the most awful thing I ever had in my life. A mix of a stereotypical demon as well as, Willie, called out to me, and said. Don't run Jason, you won't get far ha 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 I turn around and fire one shot into the night and instantly knew I hit my mark when I heard a howl that sent a shiver down my spine. But I kept running. Two miles from the bunkhouse I hear loud footsteps behind me I turn around to see the thing charging me but it was too late. I feel his claw sink into my left thigh and then pull out. I stumble and drop my rifle but keep going. I know he hit the artery blood is spewing out of my leg. I turn around and the beast isn't there. So I dart off trail to the left. I tear my shirt and find a sturdy stick and fashion a makeshift tourniquet. Those bushcraft shows really came in handy when I finally suffer the pain of tightening the TQ I press on. Much slower than I had been. I eventually make it back to the bunkhouse and fall into my bed after calling 911 but they're at least two hours away. My leg is still bleeding and I still hear it outside, lurking waiting for his chance to strike. We moved from my dad's work and I hate it here. By the freaks are coming. My dad is a well-known photographer. We always lived in the city until my dad said the city was upsetting him and money was tight. Rent in the city was too expensive. He didn't have much to photograph anymore. My parents found a house in a small town, but they hadn't shown me any photos. As an only child, I was always bored. I would be leaving my friends behind. Wolf Hollow was the name of the town in Indiana. It was a big change from Detroit, Michigan. It was an old rusty farmhouse with pieces chipping off. It looked haunted. The inside of the house looked better than the outside, and the real estate agent came by. He told us our neighbor was a nice old man named Albert. The house next door looked even worse. I got on the bus for school. It was October. I heard laughs. I couldn't find an empty seat. A girl with blonde hair and a purple hair band offered me to sit next to her. Hey doofus. A boy shouted at me. He leaned up to my shoulder and said that farm you live on is crazy, man. Your neighbor is a lunatic. You need to get out, 
dude I felt like my heart was beating out of my chest. Another boy said wait till you find out about the dogs. They come out at night. You won't ever sleep. I worried myself sick. I wondered if Albert was really a psycho and I wondered about the dogs. A few days later, I started hanging out with the girl. Her name was Shirley. I saw a light flickering off and on at Albert's house. I tried to convince myself that it's just an old house and he probably never changed the light. Then I heard howling. I saw the shadow of a dog. I wanted to scream but I didn't want to wake up my parents and I had school in the morning. After a while, the light stopped flickering and completely shut off. I saw a shadow in the window of the house several times. I watched for about two hours. A few times the shadow would come back and the light would flicker but then it would stop. I wanted to tell Shirley about this but she wouldn't believe me. Or would she? I told Shirley about it and she said the old man probably hadn't changed his light. Every night I would see a shadow. But one night, I'd seen something terrifying. A dog was tied to the tree but it was only a shadow, and a man was beating it with what looked to be a baseball bat. The man was also a shadow. The dog wasn't howling or whining. The man wasn't talking. I looked at the window of Albert's house and two red eyes stared at me. I immediately hopped onto my bed and pulled the blanket over myself. I was shaking. I saw a shadow in my room. I wished it was a dream. Shirley had a crazy idea. She wanted to sneak over to Albert's house at night and see what was going on. I declined. I would never go over to his house after what I saw. But I was terrified every night now. I saw the glass of the window bust and a man crawled toward my window and tried to climb up. He was unsuccessful. He seemed to be screaming but it just sounded like mumbles. After a certain point in the night, all the shadows disappeared. I could never understand the point behind all of this but I was starting to think Shirley wasn't so crazy. I also wanted to see what was causing this but I was scared. I didn't want to die. One Saturday night, Shirley and I walked over the Albert's house. We already heard whispers, howls, and mumbling on the way over. The front door was locked and so was the back door. Shirley wanted to check the barn first. She opened the door and the smell was the worst I'd ever smelled in my life. It smelled like something had been decaying. There were several coffins lined up and chains were on the ground. Shirley opened the first coffin. We saw a dead little girl with her mouth open. Bugs were swarming her and she looked horrible. I wanted to cry. I don't want to see anymore. I said. Good call, Shirley said. Let's try to get inside the house. She picked up a brick and carried it to the back door. She threw it at the door and failed. I heard howls and I saw a shadow of a dog creeping toward us. Hurry! Hurry! I shouted. I saw the shadow getting closer and it was howling. She threw it again and it busted the screen door. She kicked it and it barged open. I slammed the door, worrying about the shadow getting in. We were really in here. Dexter, don't make any noise. She whispered. I heard thumps, howls, and mumbles at the same time. I felt shivers crawl up my spine. As we walked further, I witnessed red eyes staring at me. The same ones I had seen that one night. They came closer. It was a man with his two arms and two legs on the ground, in the stance of a dog. Why must you awaken me? He whispered. I didn't mean to, sir. I said. Hmm. That's what they all said. What do you mean by they? Shirley asked. Those darn children, his voice raised. I like being alone, ever since my wife died. 
The man was still on the floor like a dog. His eyes were glowing red. He crawled over to my feet. I wondered if this was the Albert that the real estate agent mentioned. Because if so, this guy was nowhere near being a nice man. The howls were gone. I didn't see any shadows. All we saw was this creepy man acting like a dog. It was terrifying. I see everything you do, Dexter, he said. I advise you to pack your things. If you stay, you will be next. I'm out here alone for a reason. Now, leave. My stomach felt weird. I thought about telling the police, but what if it wasn't real? As we headed back, the shadows and the howls and all of the mumbling came back. A shadow of a dog was getting closer and we hurried to the door. We banged on it. My parents must have locked it. Mom answered the door, half asleep. Mom. You have to listen to me. I cried. She looked so confused. Surely and I couldn't just be making this up. We knew what we saw. I know, honey. She hugged me. So, I muttered. You saw it too? Mom shook her head. The shadows, the dogs, all of it. I told your father the house looked sketchy. He didn't believe me. What do we tell the cops? Shirley asked. Nothing, Mom said. You two are coming with me. Shirley, are you okay with that? What about Dad? I worried. There was no way she could leave Dad or actually take Shirley along too. I heard howls and mumbling outside again. She rushed us to the car and tried starting the engine. It wouldn't work. A shadow with red eyes started crawling toward the car. It was the one in the house. Albert. As soon as the engine started, the shadow jumped on the window and started banging. Mom put the car in drive and we zoomed off. I didn't know how to feel about Mom taking Shirley along with us. As we drove out of Wolf Hollow, I knew one thing. I would never want to come back. Even Detroit was better. Street Lights by Barry underscore Thisbone Our mother was never a superstitious woman, but she knew how to tell a good story. When my little sister and I misbehaved, mom would come up with creative ways to keep us in check. What do you mean you've never heard of the laundry goblin, she might ask. The corners of her mouth betraying a smirk that the rest of her face tried desperately to conceal. Surely you've seen him. He hides under piles of dirty clothes and snatches your ankles when you walk by. That's why it's so important to put your clothes in the hamper, where they belong. She would tell us about the spiders that lay eggs in children's mouths, but only when they forget to brush their teeth. Once, we learned that witches love vegetables. If we didn't finish our peas and carrots, they would come and eat it out of our garbage before their main course, two delicious children. Mom's stories were creepy, sure, but always fantastical and full of motherly theatrics. Her hands often turned to claws, her voice dropping several octaves to embody the monster of the week. Even from a young age, we knew it was all make-believe. Or at least, we were pretty sure. No matter how much we would giggle or roll our eyes, we didn't want to risk inviting the laundry goblin into our bedroom. So, we obeyed. Mom was a lot of things, mischievous and thrilling and loving all at once. She wore her heart on her sleeve, and I think that's why she was such a bad actress. She would come up with new stories and convince herself that she could fool us, but she could never keep a straight face. I think that's why Lydia and I both knew that something was different the first time she warned us about the streetlights. Kids, she said, seating herself at the foot of Lydia's bed after tucking us in. 
I want to talk to you about something. It might sound strange, or a little bit silly, but I need you to trust me. Can you do that? We nodded. Mom's expression was serious, but not the faux seriousness that we were used to. This felt genuine. I glanced over at Lydia. Her mouth was curved in a slight grin, most likely out of habit, but her eyes showed nothing but concern. Our mother continued speaking. Well, you kids are getting older, and with age comes certain freedoms. You both have friends of your own. You'll go out and play with them, and I won't always be there with you, and that's okay. A forced smile crossed her face as she patted Lydia on the knee. Now, we've already talked about how you should always be home by sunset. That hasn't changed. However, if you ever lose track of time, I want you to pay close attention to the street lights. She paused. Even though I didn't know what she wanted to say, I could tell she was struggling with how to say it. I looked over at Lydia once more. Her grin was replaced by a furrowed brow. If you're ever walking under a street light and it goes out, do not turn around. Don't run, and don't make any loud sounds. In fact, it's probably best not to speak at all. Just go straight home, lock the front door, and go to bed. Don't look outside. Okay? Wondering where she was going with this, I let out an uncomfortable chuckle. This is not a joke, David. Our mother was staring daggers at me. I pray to God it never happens, but if it does, you make sure you don't look behind you. Swear to me you'll do exactly as I say. We nodded again. Any questions? Mom asked, looking back and forth between Lydia and me. We shook our heads. I think we each had plenty of questions, but no idea where to begin. Mom read us a story from one of our favorite books and kissed us on the foreheads before leaving the room. Lydia and I whispered back and forth late into the night, talking about street lights and asking each other all of the questions we should have asked our mother. We speculated about what could be lurking in the dark and why we weren't allowed to look at it. We cracked a few jokes about some of our more ridiculous theories. Though we forced ourselves to laugh, I know neither of us really thought it was funny. Our conversation eventually gave way to an uncomfortable silence. David? Lydia said after a few minutes. Though she only said my name, I could hear the fear in her voice. Yeah? That was weird. Yeah. I don't know if Lydia got any sleep that night, but I know, I didn't. I stared at the ceiling until the glow of the street lights outside our bedroom window gave way to the break of dawn. Life continued on as normal for a while. Mom went back to her ridiculous nighttime fables, but every now and then we were subjected to another warning about the street lights. The tone was always the same as that first night, but our fear gradually dissolved. It was just another routine to remember. Make your bed in the morning, don't watch TV past 7 p.m., don't look behind you if a street light goes out. Lydia and I also became more comfortable asking questions. What if the light just flickers and comes back on? Don't risk it. Just come straight home and don't turn around. What happens if we turn around? Don't. Several months passed before these rules were put to the test. Halloween was always my favorite holiday, and my mom had surprised me with a Ninja Turtle costume that we couldn't afford the previous year. Lydia had insisted on dressing up as Chewbacca, despite the costume store cashier's insistence that she would make an adorable Princess Leia. Mom took us trick-or-treating that night, as she did every year. She told us that we had to stay in our neighborhood, but I begged and begged her to take us to Willowbrook Lane. Please, Mom, I said. I think I literally fell to my knees as any dramatic eight-year-old would. They give out the best candy. As soon as Lydia heard this, she joined me in begging. Our mother finally relented, 
but only on the condition that we would return home by sunset. Unfortunately for us, the rich folks on Willowbrook Lane had caught on to their reputation. House after house, we watched as the local kids in their undoubtedly expensive costumes received candy bars as big as their faces, while we were lucky to get more than a piece of hard candy that you might find in a retirement home. Mom noticed my disappointment and reluctantly agreed to travel down one more block than we had originally agreed upon. It finally felt like our efforts had paid off when the nice old couple at the end of the road brandished a basket full of king-sized chocolate bars and told us each to take three. Alright guys. It's time to head home. What do you say? Our mother called from the sidewalk. We both let out the most enthusiastic thank you of our childhood lives. Lydia, unable to contain her excitement, began to skip back to our mother before losing her footing at the edge of the front porch. Her knees met the concrete sidewalk below. She was silent for a moment before lifting the furry legs of her costume and seeing blood trickling down her shins. She let out a wail. Mom rushed over immediately, as did the elderly couple. The man retreated inside to grab some band-aids while his wife stroked Lydia's hair and told her everything would be just fine. I could tell she wasn't seriously hurt, but I hated seeing my little sister in pain. After a few minutes of waiting, the man returned outside. I'm so sorry, he said. I think we may have run out. I'll check in with the Martins next door. I'm sure they have some. Mom glanced at the sky, then at her watch. No, really, it's fine. Thank you so much for checking. We need to get home now anyway. It's just a couple of scratches. They've got three kids of their own. I'm sure they have plenty lying around. It'll just be a moment, no. Our mother replied curtly. Thank you. Really. We need to go. She grabbed us both by the wrists and we started making our way in the direction we had come. Lydia used her free hand to wipe away her tears as she continued to sniffle. Whoever was behind us seemed to be matching our pace. I made an effort to step more quietly so that my own footsteps wouldn't drown them out. It carried on for several moments before I realized the footsteps were growing closer. She didn't say a word but I know Lydia noticed it too. We kept walking. My skin felt cold. Lydia was beginning to hyperventilate. We finally turned onto our street, only a half mile or so to go. David, she pleaded. I can feel it breathing on me. The footsteps were incredibly close now. I felt as if whoever was behind us might step on the heel of my shoe at any moment or worse. Please go away, Lydia cried out. She was no longer talking to me. The footsteps continued, closer than ever. You see that tree up ahead? I asked, gesturing to an imposing willow down the road. We passed that and were practically there. Round that corner and we can see our house. Just as I thought about calling 911, or our mother, or anyone, my phone buzzed in my pocket. I knew what had happened, but I retrieved it just to confirm. It was dead. Lydia, I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. Hand me your phone. She didn't respond to my request. Instead, she started sobbing. David. I think it's pulling me. I tightened my grip around her wrist. Nothing is pulling you. We're almost home. Just keep looking forward. Her sobbing continued. What the fuck do you want? She shouted through tears. She was gasping for air at this point. What the fuck do you want? The final word of her plea echoed through our neighborhood as she broke free from my grasp and spun around. I couldn't bring myself to look at her, much less behind me. There was a sudden emptiness to my side where she had been moments before. I closed my eyes, but didn't dare break my stride. 
tears streamed down my face as I carried on toward home. I no longer heard Lydia's labored breathing, her sobs, her cries for reassurance. All I could hear were two sets of footsteps, walking calmly and methodically behind me. Lydia? I called out. Are you alright? Please say something. I begged repeatedly for an answer as I made my way home, but my desperation was met with silence. My followers carried on behind me, matching my pace and refusing to say a word. This isn't funny. I shouted, though I knew no one was joking. After a few minutes that felt like hours, I breached the threshold to our home and slammed the door behind me. I closed my eyes and fumbled through the darkness to ensure that the blinds were closed and that I wouldn't be exposed to whatever was outside. I immediately plugged my phone into its charger and tried to call Lydia as soon as it returned to life. Straight to voicemail. What's going on? My mother had emerged in her nightgown, a glass of wine in her hand. Where's Lydia? I searched for the words but they wouldn't come. I gestured toward the front door, shaking my head back and forth. I'm sorry was all I could say through my tears. The realization set into her face almost immediately. She turned around, she asked. I stared at the floor beneath me, not saying a word. She fell to the floor and so did her glass of wine, shattering at her feet. She covered her face with her hands and let out a scream. To this day, I've never heard anything like it. I wanted to hug her, to hold her, but I was frozen. My mother pounded the floor with her hands until blood dripped from them, shards of glass protruding from her palms and knuckles. What do we do? I finally choked out. She's gone, baby, she answered. She's gone. We held each other and cried through the night. She made me tell her everything that had happened since the end of the game. We're going to have to make a police report, she told me. We can't tell them the truth. They'll think you did something. I'm not losing both of my babies. We came up with a story together. Originally, I suggested that we tell the police I never saw Lydia after the game. My mother said that other students or parents may have seen us leave the stadium together. Simon, despite his drunkenness, might remember seeing us on Main Street. I would have to tell them that she had insisted on walking to a friend's house, and that we had parted ways at some point on the walk home. It was best if she had never told me which friend, my mother had said. When Lydia didn't come home from her imaginary sleepover, my mother called a few of Lydia's friend's parents, feigning a tone of calm concern. She wasn't at your house last night, she'd ask. Tears poured down her cheeks, but you wouldn't know it from her voice. Eventually, she called the police. I'm sure she's fine, she lied. It's just, her phone seems to be dead and we haven't heard from her. We just want to make sure she's safe. The following weeks and months were characterized by an uncomfortable combination of mourning and lying. We didn't know that Lydia was dead, per se, but mom was convinced that she wasn't coming back to us. I never doubted her. The town's police force hosted search parties. We showed up, feigning enthusiasm and hopefulness, knowing that all of it was for nothing. Behind closed doors, my mother and I wept as we tried to accept the truth that we couldn't share with anyone else. There was a strange relief when the rest of our town started to give up. The search parties became less frequent until they stopped altogether. I was just happy to stop wasting everyone's time and felt freedom in my ability to mourn publicly. Mom was never the same again. She stopped going to work and started drinking more than I had ever seen. She had to sell the house, and we moved back to our old neighborhood, into a house even smaller than the one I grew up in. She never stopped being my mother, of course. She was physically present for all of my major events and ceremonies, but she was never really there. 
Her whimsy and infectious love of life were gone, and it wasn't just because I was older. I often wondered if she wished she was dead. I graduated high school and got into a good college. Decent grades, a mediocre athletic career, and a heartbreaking essay about a missing sister and an alcoholic mother will do that, I guess. I picked up a few bad habits myself in the following years. I drank constantly, smoked way too much weed, and skipped most of my classes. By the time I started my junior year, I was on academic probation. I wasn't exactly careful about the street lights either. Until the night that Lydia disappeared, I had been careful to never walk around after sunset. In my little college town, however, I was stumbling home from the bars at 2 in the morning on a regular basis. For over four years, the street lights stayed on. I often fantasized about what I would do if they didn't. Maybe if I turned around next time, I could find out what happened to her. Maybe I could be with my sister again. December rolled around. I dreaded going home for winter break. I dreaded the thought of facing my mother and her emptiness. I dreaded the thought of having to hide my drinking from her, though I knew that she would probably be too drunk herself to notice. After finishing my finals for the fall semester, I decided to step out of my comfort zone and go to a house party. I wasn't even invited, but I wandered in and helped myself to punch and cigarettes from friendly strangers, pretending to be a friend of a friend of a friend. I spent the entire night standing in the backyard, smoking and drinking and hardly saying a word to anyone. When the world began spinning around me, I zipped up my coat and started making my way back to my dingy apartment. It took me an embarrassingly long time to find my way out of the neighborhood I was in, and back to the town's main thoroughfare. I had no clue how much time had passed. I retrieved my phone from my coat pocket to check dead, as it often was. It was rare that I found myself on this side of town, but the way home seemed easy enough. Even as inebriated as I was, I knew it was just a few miles down MLK Boulevard, and my apartment complex would be impossible to miss. After several minutes of walking, I crested a hill and looked upon a bus stop a few hundred yards ahead of me. The glass shelter bench was illuminated by a street light above. The sight was strangely intoxicating. My own little suburban oasis. I decided that I would have a seat when I reached it and pray for the spins to go away. Maybe stick a finger down my throat and purge some of the vodka that was sloshing around inside me. That plan was quickly foiled as I got closer. When I was about 100 feet away, the street light above the bus stop turned off without so much as a flicker. I stopped walking. For years I had convinced myself that I was no longer afraid, that I was too dead inside to care about what might happen to me. I immediately realized I had been full of shit. I was terrified. My breathing became labored, and my fingers twitched with anticipation. Does this even count? I wasn't beneath the street light when it went out. Could I just turn around and go back to the house party? No, I couldn't do that. What if it was already behind me? In spite of my intuition telling me to turn and run, I carried on. As I approached spitting distance of the glass enclosure, I heard the unmistakable sound of a bus arriving. Wasn't it too late for the campus buses to be running? Or had I stayed out so late that I was witnessing the first loop? The bus grinded to a halt just as I passed the bench. I so desperately wished I could sit down and cry and vomit and do whatever else my body wanted me to do. I heard the hydraulic sound of the bus doors opening, followed by a single set of footsteps disembarking onto the sidewalk. I was prepared to be accompanied by that sound and nothing more for the remainder of my walk, when a voice called out to me. David? A shiver crept down my spine. I knew that voice. It sounded older and more mature than the last time I had heard it, but familiar nonetheless. 
the footsteps broke into a jog until she was just behind me. Is that really you? Lydia's voice pierced my skin. I said nothing and continued walking forward. I watched as the bus rolled past on my left. It was full. The silhouettes of its many passengers stared forward, unmoving. David, what's wrong? Aren't you going to turn around? Maybe this was all a misunderstanding. Maybe Lydia had pulled a prank on me and her mother four years ago before running away. Maybe she was ready to come home. I shook my head as if to extinguish that thought. It was crazy. But wasn't the alternative even crazier? I missed you, she called. I'm sorry I left. I finally responded. Please stop this. Lydia laughed. Oh good, I was worried you might have lost your voice. Can you please just look at me? We should catch up. Whatever you are, please stop this. She scoffed. Whatever you are. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm your baby sister. Do you even care? Don't you want to know where I've been? No, I said. Not really. You're a piece of shit, David. You always have been. No wonder you and mom never really looked for me. I walked in silence for a few minutes, hearing nothing but the footsteps carrying on behind me. I realized that, besides the bus, I hadn't seen a single vehicle or person on this entire walk. Even at that hour, that seemed strange. I'm sorry, David. I didn't mean it. I've just... I've really missed you. Again, I said nothing. I'm so cold. Do you have a cigarette? She asked. You don't smoke. We haven't seen each other in years. How would you know? We were now passing the dorm that I had lived in during my first year of college. I thought maybe I could go knock on the door and find a student to let me in. I wondered what would happen if they saw her behind me. Would they see anything at all? I decided against it. My mother's words echoed in my mind from that very first night, do not turn around. Mom was wrong, you know, Lydia said. It sounded like she was grinning as she spoke. It's beautiful there. I can show you. I gritted my teeth and squinted my eyes. I know you're not Lydia. Please go away. Then who the fuck am I? The voice was different this time, as if another voice was buried within, as if Lydia was just a mask. For the next 30 minutes or so, my follower continued to beg in my baby sister's voice for me to turn around. Its tone alternated between anger, grief, desperation, and wonder, as if it couldn't decide on a strategy to manipulate me. When I finally reached the front door of my apartment, I paused before turning the key. Are you going to follow me in? I would love to come in. I opened the door and lowered my head. If I was going to die, I wanted it to be on my terms. I stepped inside and waited. Can I come in? I've been so cold, she said. I slammed the door behind me and fell to the floor, my arms covering my face. I gripped tufts of my own hair and pulled, thinking that physical pain might be a welcome distraction. I breathed a sigh of relief. I made it. Then the knocking started. David, please. You don't know what it's been like. Let me in. You are not welcome here. I'm still your sister, David. Please. I called out for my roommate, Nick, before remembering that he had already returned home for winter break. You don't need him. You need me. Go away. I'm begging you. Did you even know it's your birthday? What's happened to you? She was right. Happy 21st to me, I guess. I thought about finally trashing my fake ID and chuckled to myself. I got you a present. You're going to love it. 
I was alone in my apartment, but I started to feel as if someone was pulling me upwards, silently convincing me to give her a chance. Would she look different? Would it look like her at all? I pounded my fist against my forehead a few times and stood up fully before storming into my bedroom. I hastily closed the door and locked it behind me. The apartment was old and its walls were thin. The pounding on my front door didn't sound any quieter from there. It's been three days now. I haven't eaten, I haven't slept. I couldn't even if I wanted to. I was grateful to have two large water bottles on my nightstand a preemptive measure for hangover control, but those were depleted quickly. I can't leave my bedroom. There's a window inches from my front door, and the curtains are wide open. I know I don't have the strength to keep my eyes closed. Why has no one checked on me? Classes are over, sure, but someone has to be looking for me. Something has been knocking on my door for three days straight and no one has called the cops or even stopped to ask questions. My phone is dead and the charger is in the living room. My laptop is here, but the Wi-Fi is disconnected. Did I forget to pay the bill? I've tried screaming at the top of my lungs and banging on the wall that I share with the neighboring unit to no avail. I'm so thirsty. Am I dying? I think I'm seeing things. There's a pile of dirty laundry in the corner of my room. Was that there before? I swear to God I think I see a pair of eyes peeking through it. I can hear my sister outside. She says she came to surprise me at school. I've really missed her, and she says she's missed me too. Feels like I haven't seen her in ages. I think we're going to go grab some coffee in a moment. And water. Lots and lots of water. Nick, if you find this before I get back home, don't worry. I'll be back soon. I can't wait for you to meet my sister. If my mom calls, tell her everything is going to be fine. I'm going somewhere with Lydia. Somewhere beautiful. That was all for today. Glad you guys listened till the end. Don't forget to like the video and share with your friends. Also send in your own scary stories at horrorxperiencemedia at gmail.com so your work can get featured in my videos. You can find the link in the description. Subscribe for more similar stories and see you guys in the next video.